thank you very much for coming. Isn't it been a good day? Decent way to spend your Saturday, rather than pushing a trolley around Ikea, <laughs> buying coat hangers and what, tea lights and all of those things. Ah, this is good. I'm standing between you and the craft beer event, um, which, as somebody that doesn't drink, my talk will probably be about four and a half hours. So if you want to get one in right now. Um, I've got a, a confession to make. I, uh, a few years ago, my interest in designing for the web completely waned. Um, I just lost interest in what I was seeing and I really felt like web design had stagnated, that we somehow had replaced creativity with trying to make things predictable um, and that somehow ideas were less important than data or research or all of these other terribly boring things. Um, oh, I need to, uh, I think I need to change the title, sorry. There we go, right, now, this is, we all know this isn't going to end well, just like when Jerry Halliwell left the Spice Girls. Now, when I began to work on some projects with uh, a legendary newspaper and magazine designer, a guy called Mark Porter, I became fascinated by art direction and magazine and editorial design. As someone that hadn't studied those things when I went to art school, everything about this area was different, it was exciting, it was new. And the more inspired I got, by magazine design, the faster that my enthusiasm for designing for the web bounced back. And you know, I often wonder why so many web designers think that print is somehow old fashioned or irrelevant to what we do. I'm losing my microphone. Technology. So I now buy magazines as regularly as I possibly can. And uh, a week before last Christmas, I actually um, spent some time, I'm getting very confused with these two remotes. There we go. Um, I was in a magazine store with some friends, it's sort of <laughs> evangelizing about magazine and print design. And a friend of mine suggested, you know, why don't you actually write a series about um, magazine and editorial design and, and what you find fascinating and how um, we can actually learn some lessons from those things and apply them to the web. And that actually, that conversation sparked the idea for a series on inspired design decisions, which I'm doing for Smashing Magazine. And every month I choose an art director or a designer or a publication or a magazine. Look at the what makes that design distinctive, the lessons that we can learn from it, and then how we can use those lessons to make better work for the web. So I'm really happy to say that you know, I'm inspired and I'm motivated again, and I really hope that this series is gonna do the same thing for, for other people. And uh, my bookcases are now absolutely chock full of magazine design inspiration. You know, the collection is still growing. And uh, this is a, a magazine that I picked up fairly recently. It's a magazine on printmaking called Pressing Matters. And when I read it, I was immediately transported back to art school. My wife will remember when my fingers were chopped up from using uh, lino cutting tools. I just smelt like turpentine all the time, which I'm sure was very attractive. And uh, Pressing Matters has this really simple but distinctive style, and it uses a very limited color palette. It often connects the color of elements to 
other elements which are found in nearby objects like illustrations or photographs. And the end result is very much like the thing that we want to accomplish on the web, which is a connected experience. And it uses layout patterns which produce this rhythm that flows throughout the magazine. And it uses differently sized layout modules which speed you past smaller pieces of information, pages that are packed with prints, and then the pace will slow you right down using larger panels so that you linger on the reproductions of the artwork. And what struck me about pressing matters in particular was how this magazine contained a variety of different layout styles which were demanded by the different types of content, but it still maintains a really high degree of consistency right the way throughout. And whereas so many people I hear recite this mantra that the web isn't print, there's so much that we can learn which will make our web designs better. So when I looked more closely at how these pages were constructed, what I discovered was a layered compound grid which was comprised of two and three column grids overlaid on each other, which ran throughout the magazine. And a compound grid is a tool which was made famous by a typographer and graphic designer called Carl Gerstner. Anybody heard of Gerstner? So she's nodding quietly in the background. Gerstner was a, a Swiss artist. Perhaps he was one of the most influential typographers. Trouble is, books about his work have been out of print for decades, so it's pretty unlikely that you're going to have seen his work firsthand, but it's still been incredibly influential. And by a really strange coincidence, I actually found out recently that Gerstner's ad agency created ads for Sinar, which is a, a Swiss large format camera maker that I actually worked for back in the 1990s. And Gerstner was one of the first designers to exploit the creative flexibility of using grids. And it's the compound grid which he created for this, which is Capital Magazine, which became one of his best known creations. And given the potential variety of Capital's content, Gerstner needed a grid which would help him to lay out any type of content consistently and without any restrictions. So Gerstner created what he called a mobile grid, not the kind of mobile that you and I know about. Um, and this grid is most likely what you'll find if you do a Google search for compound grid. If you're confused, so was I. So this compound grid designed by, uh, designed for capital, I've got it's gone too wrong. Um, it looks incredibly complex. So I'm gonna break it down into, uh, into its constituent parts. There are 58 rows and columns in a mobile grid. Gerstner started with just one. So content in this single module fills the full width of the page. Then he divided up single module into two columns and rows, and using two columns in this way results in a reassuring symmetrical design. And that large module can also be divided into three columns and rows, and he's keeping the gutter and the margins the same, regardless of how many uh, grid modules he uses. And by splitting that module into four, those columns of content feel a lot more formal. The over impre overall impression is that this design is a, a serious one. And when this full page module is divided into five columns and separated by two different spatial zones, this design feels a lot more technical. And with Gerstner's mobile grid, 
you can use each set of columns and rows separately, or you can turn them into a compound, either by overlaying or by stacking one on top of the other. So dividing the page up into six columns, six rows, enables this incredible variety of layout options. And the flexibility of a compound grid comes from the interplay of two or more grids. Is that right? So a compound grid is two or more grids of any type. That can be column grids, modular, symmetrical, or asymmetrical grids all on one page. And they can occupy these separate areas or they can overlap. And just as a simple thing, if you want to start playing with, with compound grids, you can start making a simple compound by overlaying two columns, um, one with two grids, one with two columns, and one with three columns. And by using any number of equally sized columns and rows, this layout forms this consistent pattern. It's an even rhythm. We talked about or heard about bootstrap a few times today. Nobody's talked about um, what I think is possibly the worst aspect of the, uh, the bootstrap phenomenon, which is everybody using a 12-column symmetrical grid as the starting point for every design. If you think of each one of those columns as a beat and you tap those out on your chair, what you don't get is a particularly entertaining rhythm. If you compare that to the rhythm that you'd get from a 2 one, one, 2 type pattern, you can understand why using a compound grid can change both the visual result, but also your mental model as to how you use grids. So a compound grid of two or three columns creates a, a rhythmic pattern of two, one, one, two. And then for an altogether different design, you know, perhaps one which is using um, italicized type to suggest the movement in this car, um, you know, you might stagger the paragraphs to create this dynamic diagonal which runs through the page. And changing that compound formation to combine three and four columns creates a completely different rhythmic pattern. This one is three, one, two, two, one, three. This same combination can make for a very different impression by combining column widths from both grids to inform, for example, the width of my running text. And that column perfectly matches the width of that portrait orientation car over on the right-hand side. And this time, I set the block of running text across two of those columns, and I've derived the width of those um, by combining column widths from both the four and the five column grid. And overlaying um, four, is that the right one? Yeah. Overlaying four columns with five leads to this really unusual rhythmic pattern. Six, one, four, three, four, one, six. Come to how we can implement those in a minute. So in this version of the design, this large image shows off the iconic shape of this uh, E-type car, and then the solid block of text sits right underneath the wheels, and we get the width of that column from both the four column and the six column grid. And then this design literally places that E-type at the center of the action and it wraps the text around both sides, which adds real energy and movement to the design. So I mostly use fraction units, FR units, um, as the pattern for my compound grids. And the result of a two plus three compound um, is four columns um, where the outer two columns um, are double the width of the two inner columns. Whereas a, a combination of three and four column grids is going to result in six columns and this rhythmic pattern of three, one, two, two, one, three. And a combination of four and five columns 
is going to result in six columns and a different rhythmic pattern. And then finally, combining four and six columns together creates eight columns. Um, and two of them are much, much narrower than the rest. And that's a rhythmic pattern there of, uh, of two, one, one, two, two, one, one, two, which is actually a pattern I use um, a lot. So a compound grid might seem complex, but it's actually no more difficult to implement than any other eight or 12 column grid. You know, I need ridiculously few HTML elements to actually implement this layout. And the CSS is even more compact. It's much more stable even than using other layout tools. So I want to tell you about an art director from the 1940s and 50s, a guy called Alexei Brodovich. And I began to study Brodovich when I became fascinated by editorial and magazine design. And I was drawn to just how precise um, Brodovich's work was. In particular, the way in which he brought photographs and text together. I also kind of appreciate his rebellious rejection of anything that he considered to be mediocre. And he was actually born in what is today Belarus, and he moved to Paris, where he actually beat Pablo Picasso to second place in a poster competition, amazingly. And then moved to the United States, where he taught. Um, and he told his students to astonish me, which I, I just love that kind of attitude. And Harper's Bazaar became um, Brodovich's most well-known project, and to keep his designs fresh, he often commissioned work from European artists, people like Jean Cocteau and Marc Chagall and Man Ray. Not the kind of people you'd expect in a commercial fashion magazine. And his knowledge of photography gave his work this classic feel, and he often cropped photographs in really unexpected ways. He'd place them off center. He'd sometimes bleed them outside the margins of the page to create these compositions which were full of energy and movement. And throughout his career at Harper's Bazaar and then beyond, he frequently used content in photographs or illustrations to inform the placement and the position and the shape of his text. And his color choices were also bold. He used large blocks of color for emphasis. And I just find his design process as fascinating as the finished work, because I often learn more about how someone thinks by looking at their work in progress than I do at what they ended up with. And Brodovich dis began designing his layouts by using sketches on paper. And then he arranged those spreads on the floor of his studio to create this, the pace of the magazine. Now, this might seem at first like a, a random um, collection uh, arrangement of pictures. But in fact, everyone was deliberately placed. And it fills this design with movement. And we can use the same technique today, even when we're designing flexible, responsive layouts. So for this first Brodovich-inspired design, I'm just going to scatter four differently sized images across the viewport. And I can arrange these images horizontally, vertically, even diagonally, depending on the screen dimensions. So to help me design a consistent experience across different screen sizes, I often form my own storyboard from a small series of sketches. So for smaller screens, I'm going to turn those images into a, a horizontally scrolling panel. And then on medium-sized screens, I'm going to scatter those images vertically um, to maintain the visual hierarchy in that portrait orientation. Now, to develop this design, I can use a combination of 
CSS Grid, and Flexbox, and CSS Transforms. And my markup is incredibly minimal and semantic. I've only got three structural elements for layout. And then to implement this design, I'm going to use that 4 plus 6 compound grid that I showed you earlier. And then I can place each one of those elements onto the grid and then reposition them using a media query at the widest screen size. And then I can nudge or rotate those pictures to give them that scattered look which Brodovich inspired. Now, people have told me that designs like this are appropriate for editorial design. They might be you know, relevant to print, um, but not for products or websites. Um, that isn't the case at all. Um, this is an example I used that same kind of scattered pictured approach to bring this design for a new electric Vespa scooter to life. So I don't accept that this stuff is okay for print but not for web. And Brodovich made the double page spread his playground and using this large canvas to carefully construct these compositions. So facing pages here allow Brodovich the possibility to contrast or to connect both sides of the spread. So this larger screen design splits that viewport into two columns and it uses color and shape to reflect one side with the other. And all I need is three structural elements to implement this design. I need a heading, a main element and an aside element. We've heard about the importance of using these uh, HTML elements before. And then on smaller screens, all I need are just foundation styles because the normal flow is going to take care of the order of the content. But then for med medium-sized screens, I can apply grid properties to both of those main and aside elements so that I can then position the content on the grid. And then for larger screens, I can place those main and the aside elements onto the grid using a couple of named lines. So with a little imagination, with a little inspiration, we can make much more distinctive and engaging designs. Now, shapes add movement to a design. They help draw people in. They help connect an audience with a story or with a product, and they make this tighter connection between the visual and the written content. So inspired by Brodovich for this next design, the shape of this running text reflects the shape in the header image, which is opposite. And I've seen very, very few examples of using CSS shapes which go beyond just using basic Shapes, And I wonder sometimes whether that's because people have become so conscious of um, making designs that are, you know, responsive and maybe not understanding that, you know, you, browsers not only, uh, designs not only have to, don't have to look the same across different browsers, but they don't necessarily have to look the same across different screen sizes either. We ought to be adapting our design while maintaining a consistent look and feel. So you can also use shapes to, to sculpt structural shapes from solid blocks of running text in the style of Brodovich. So the markup that I need to implement this design is similar to the previous example. It's just a header which contains a picture element and then a main element for the running text. You know, of course, designs like this aren't going to make sense at every screen width. But, you know, who said that websites need to look the same on every screen? Now, if you're using a browser that's, you know, ancient, that potentially doesn't support CSS shapes, no problem. If we think about things from a progressive enhancement point of view, then all we're going to get is a, a standard straight vertical column of text. Nobody dies. 
And it's often, you need really little markup to develop dynamic and original layouts. You know, inside my main element, I've just got two SVG images, which I use to carve the shape of that running text. And then for larger screens, I can just apply a symmetrical two-column grid to the body, place the header and the main elements using these named lines. And then I can rotate that header image clockwise and place the transform origin in the center so that it stays in the middle of my header. And then all that remains is me to float those SVG shape images left and right so that the running text runs between them and it mirrors the shape of that rotated image which was opposite. So you can see the ghost of those SVG images. And that's the end result. Now, tools like CSS Shapes give us countless opportunities to capture readers' attention, keep people engaged. And flexible designs, which include um, precisely positioned elements, they were really hard to do using CSS positioning and floats. But modern CSS techniques have made these designs much more straightforward to accomplish. And I hope that that's going to result in a new generation of much more inspired designs. So this next design is, uh, is again, inspired by a spread from Alexei Brodovich. It's from Portfolio magazine. And here he used this striking combination of black and white columns and a, and a bold splash of color. Now, before implementing any design, again, I'm going to make a simple storyboard just to demonstrate how these elements are going to flow across a selection of screen sizes. And the footer, which either occupies the bottom on a small screen or the whole of the right-hand side on a large screen, because it needs a little bit more styling. So to accomplish the stripy background effect, I'm actually just going to use a CSS gradient rather than using any images. And then I can place um, and position each one of those images and use the clip path property to clip each one so that only a third of them is visible. Um, and this is a really useful property. I'm surprised that we don't see this used more often online. These clipping paths can form any shape. They can form basic circles or ellipses or complex polygon shapes with any number of coordinates. So for this first image, I'm going to clip the right-hand side, which is only going to leave the 33% on the black area. I'm going to position the second image absolutely. I'm going to use a lower z-index value, which is going to send it to the bottom of my stacking order. And then for the third and final image, I'm going to clip the left-hand side, which is going to leave only that right portion visible. And then the design also includes an SVG circle, which I um, position over those images. And I can use a blend mode, a mixed blend mode, which tints the color of the elements below it in the stacking order. And again, you can see how that thing can adapt across a selection of different screen sizes using grid as appropriate. So since I discovered his work, I think Brodovich has probably been the most substantial influence on my design over the past couple of years. Um, and his inability to accept anything which is mediocre, it's pushed me still to try to think beyond what's expected from a product or from a website design. So I want to tell you about Beer Feitler. Now, Feitler was actually born in Rio de Janeiro in 1938. She worked on album covers and book designs and magazines and posters um, in Brazil and then moved to Manhattan. 
And in 1961, she was still only 25 years old. Um, she became an art assistant and then one of the youngest um, and the first female co-art directors at Harper's Bazaar magazine. And despite her portfolio, which contains things like Richard Avedon's famous pink space helmet and John Lennon naked on the cover of Rolling Stone, she's actually been described as the pioneering female art director that you've never heard of. You know, on top of everything, she actually once kissed Andy Warhol as well. I suppose today's equivalent would be me kissing Hayden Pickering. <laughs> what? We'll come up here, son. <laughs> ah. So one of my famous, one of my favourite quotes from Beer Feitler, which could just as easily apply or be describing of the web, is that a magazine should flow. It should have a rhythm. You can't look at one page alone. You have to visualize what comes before and after. Good editorial design is all about creating a harmonic flow. I truly believe that that is as appropriate to the web um, as it was then. And like Alexei Brodovich, she fundamentally understood the dynamics of the double page spread. And her bold designs are only a part of what make her life and her work fascinating. Even more important was how her work reflected changes in society in America during the 1960s and the bold choices that she made to influence it. Um, in fact, she cast the first black model um, on the cover of a mainstream fashion magazine in 1965. Um, and came under incredible criticism for it. I think it was like over a decade later until another black model was on the cover of Harper's Bazaar. Now, she's done so much to teach people who design for the web today, as much, I think, as she did to the magazine designers who followed her. I just hope in some small way with talks like this that I can help people fall in love with her work the way that I did. So this is one design that really stands out for me from Harper's Bazaar. Um, I just love the way in which we have this kind of contrast and yet balance between both sides of the screen. I wanted to play with that. I wanted to see how we might adapt that uh, for the web, but still keep it relevant for products and websites. Um, so, I want to try to find ways through all of these examples to illustrate that this is not just an academic design exercise, this is something that we can and should experiment with and apply to the work we do online. So to implement the, this first design, I'm just using a minimal set of uh, structural elements, as small as I can. So we've got a header, a main, and an aside element which has the content. Now, this is where it starts to get interesting, because that landscape image fits really well on a larger size screen. But when you use it on a small screen, if you look at that on a phone, we completely lose the visual hierarchy of that particular page. So we need to change our image, use a wider format um, for screens which are wider than they are tall. So this media query, which can be used in style sheets as an alternative to a, a more conventional um, width query, or it can be used on things like picture elements. So in landscape orientation, I've got a symmetrical two-column grid and this linear gradient which fills um, the full height of the screen. And the result is this design which adapts the layout depending on whether the browser or the screen or the device is in landscape or in portrait orientation. Now, the Volkswagen Beetle, I don't know whether anyone has ever owned one, 
little car, big personality. So for this next example, which was inspired by Bea Feitler, I wanted my design to have some personality to match. So this large screen design uses this enormous picture of the Beatles wheel to emphasize, contrast with, the smallness of that little car. And three structural elements make up the markup that I need to implement this design. Again, it's a header for the large wheel um, picture, a figure which contains the, the smaller image of the car, and then a main element for my running text. So before I get to the, the large screen, I just want to make sure that I maintain the contrast in scale, even on the smallest screens. You might notice there's a, a problem with some of that. You know, one problem that I've encountered a lot um, when developing flexible layouts is this kind of unintentional um, resizing of images. So with a fixed height on the header element and 100% width on the image, this giant wheel is going to get distorted. I'm going to give that mini an unintentional flat, uh, BW an unintentional flat tire. Fortunately, there's a way in which I can preserve the aspect ratio using the object fit property in CSS. So contain preserves an image aspect ratio while fitting inside the parent containing box. So the image is contained inside the box. Whereas cover preserves the aspect ratio, but this time it fills the whole box. So when this happens, parts of the image outside of that content box are going to be hidden. It's going to cover the content box. And then in this alternative version of the design, I can preserve the difference in scale between those two pictures at a variety of different screen sizes. And it's incredibly important um, to consider how we can maintain both a consistent experience and maintain um, visual hierarchy across different views of our same design. Now, Feitler's choice of bold colors was one of the hallmarks of her work. It attracted me immediately. So for this next inspired design, I contrast this deep red um, with a vibrant yellow, and then I reverse the colors on both sides of the design. So while this Feitler inspired design is really big on color, it's also incredibly small on markup. I just need two structural elements. I just need a header, which contains a figure and a division, and a main element, which also contains a figure and a division. And then for medium-sized screens, I want the figure and the divisions inside both of those elements to occupy half the height of the viewport. So I'm going to add a symmetrical two-column grid and a minimum height there of 100 VH viewport height units. And then I can place those onto my symmetrical grid. Now, I want this design to fill the screen with color from edge to edge, so on larger screens, I'm going to apply that asymmetrical two-column grid, which is going to extend the full height of my body element. And then I can reposition those, in, those elements for larger screens. So, Feitler has just done so much to um, teach people who design for the web today, even without knowing it. Um, sadly, she, she died of cancer at the age of only 42. Um, and there is only one book, retrospective book, available about Feitler's work. It was written by her nephew. Um, and it was only published in Portuguese in Brazil in 2012. And it took me absolutely months to track down a copy. Um, eventually, I, I got one. It was the most expensive book that I've ever bought. 150 quid. Um, 
My financial director is sitting at the back there. Um, but do you know what? For the inspiration that I got and for the motivation and for just the rekindling of my interest in design, it was worth every penny. So if I want you to take away any kind of message from this talk today, is that there's so much more that we can do with web design, so many bold choices that we can make. We don't have to conform to somebody else's idea of what constitutes good design for a digital product or for a website. We can use instinct, we can use our gut to drive an idea forward. We don't have to research it or put it through a focus group or, you know, test it to death. Um, we can just make bold design choices and produce work which, you know, is incredible. Um, whoops. So, speaking of work which is slightly less incredible, um, I did write a book and it would be rude of me not to promote it here. You can get have a look at this art direction for the web.com. There is also a video series um, which is available because um, we're all friends here. You can get 50% discount with the code Ace of Spades. And uh, thank you very much for encouraging my bad behaviour. <laughs> <laughs>